I'm so excited to see you guys again. We're going to, as they say, as they say, I say, because I'm part of they now, but as they say, jump right in. So I am talking about the Marion Keys series that is of the Walsh family, a family that she created in her very first novel, Watermelon. The series was about a family of sisters. And the first book starts with the oldest sister, Claire. It's a kind of what was considered, I guess, a modern rom-com type book of the time where she had just had a baby and her husband abandons her in the hospital, tells her he's leaving her for another woman. They were living in the city at the time and with that having happened to her, she decides that she's going to go back home to Ireland, to Dublin, to be uh, more specific, no. She is in her late 20s and the entire ordeal of postpartum, post not getting the life that you thought you were going to end up with, the fantasy of the husband and baby and happily ever after ensues. She's a character who seems to have been oblivious to the fact that there were issues in her marriage. She really thought that she was living the middle-class fairy tale, went to college, came from a good family, kind of messed around for a little bit post-college, didn't know what she was doing, met a guy, built a life, got married, had a baby, and again, you're supposed to live happily ever after. And there's actually a lot of that conversation with herself in the story of, but this wasn't supposed to be happening to me. I thought these things happened to other people, less fortunate people, or people who come from a different background, or people who are struggling in different ways that I'm not struggling. So that's the first book in the series because she goes back home, you end up meeting her family at their, I guess, youngest that you will really kind of meet them. There is some flashbacks in other books, but it's the beginning of your relationship with this family and you're going to meet the mother who is kind of saucy and the father who is in a family of all women who kind of gets told what to do and has accepted this fact of his life. It's kind of a, again, at that time, time especially a modern marriage in that the mom doesn't cook she's a horrible cook doesn't even try to pretend that she can cook but it's still obviously old-fashioned um but it's a, a man being kind of the second role in the story that the entire series is very much dominated by the women of this family and i feel like it's on purpose and i think that's what is a essential part of what drew readers to that family because especially then in the late 90s early 2000s it was the beginning of having that conversation or it had been a very a very young conversation that we were having around gender roles and what's the expectation and a woman being able to be whoever and whatever she wanted even though you know the working woman started way before that time but again it was it was really a kind of an ongoing conversation letting go of these old norms now it's not only the first book in the series watermelon which was in 95 it's not only the first book in the series but it's it's also marion key's first book so we will say a couple of things one that you could tell that she was a brand new writer she was funny she was absolutely naturally funny but there was a lot of kind of inner monologue that she would have with Claire's character that was funny, but it would just go on for too long. And then the story, like I said, is basically a rom-com and some of it is a little cheesy. It's not too complex. And then also certain things haven't really aged very well. I hadn't read the books in a really long time. I reread Watermelon and Rachel's Holiday for this video. And there's a lot of body image talk, especially around weight, post-baby weight. Again, like I said, it's a family of women. So Claire's the oldest, Maggie's the second oldest. You have Rachel, who's number three, and then Anna, who's four, Helen, who's five. They run from late 20s down to Helen, who I think in the first book is somewhere around 17-ish. The two youngest, Helen and Anna, are built small petite and not just in height but also they're just thinner and that's she describes them like that the three oldest are built more like their mother tall 
and it comes out in the Rachel's Holiday book that the mom has always been self-conscious about her height, so she's kind of stigmatized that with her daughters. And then also you have the fact that they are just larger built women. They have rounder figures, more hourglass type shapes, which at that time wasn't really the aesthetic. Like today, that would be a wonderful thing or even heading into, you know, the 2010s, but late 90s, early 2000s, you were still very much in the wafy world with body shape for women. It is a large conversation. It comes up a lot in the book. You can tell that she's trying to write a book for women in the voice of women and she's trying to write things that women would think about themselves or be conscious of or conversations they would have with each other about body image because let's be real we all have those conversations with each other but the language that she's using isn't always kind and we're not always kind to ourselves when we talk about body image but it just has evolved especially in popular culture, literature, things of that nature, that book or that type of language about oneself, like being excited about how her grief right after being abandoned meant that she dropped multiple dress sizes and hadn't been that small since pre-baby. You wouldn't really be celebrating that today. Might you think that, kind of still, right? But you just really wouldn't find it in a book. So there were certain things that didn't age well, and she was a new writer. By the time she writes Rachel's Holiday, you can see that she got away a bit from the funny taking too long and unraveling for, for enough time for her to be less funny. And it's also a more complicated story. So in essence, I guess you could kind of call it still a rom-com, but the centralized story is about a woman, a young woman who is the third sister down, Rachel, who has a drug problem. That is Rachel's Holiday, which was written in 98. So she's in New York, living her best life, getting high and having fun all the time, and ends up overdosing. From that situation, her boyfriend and her best friend and her one of her sisters shows up to stick her on a plane to send her home to go to rehab. Her parents have paid for her to go to the cloisters, which especially at that time, it was a, I guess, fashionable name in the drug addiction space. You heard about all kinds of celebrities having gone there and I think that it was definitely glamorized the way that Marion Keys glamorizes it or the way that Marion Keys has Rachel glamorizing it and having this expectation of it heading into her stay there. Once she gets there against her will, but she's okay with it because she thinks she's going to this famous people's spa. Once she gets there, the reader especially, like I said, if you were around during the time, is also surprised that there is no spa. There is nothing fancy. It is just a treatment facility, a bit run down, and focusing on recovering addicts instead of getting a Swedish massage, as is her expectation, and I think a little bit of ours was too. So that in itself was funny, and I can tell you that there was more than one time when I was reading it where I was like, okay, is this actually the Cloisters, or are they just calling it the Cloisters? There's actually a different Cloisters that all those famous people were going to. I, I was having a racial moment where I was in denial. So she goes through her whole experience in there, and you meet the other addicts who are in rehab with her, different types of addiction. There's a lot of older men who are alcoholics who are there and you start to again be introduced to a bit of writing that didn't age well. There's a bit of a theme of most of these men being wife or family batterers. That being a reality doesn't really change the fact that the way that they're written about they're kind of middle-aged old fat men who like to beat on their wives and it and it just feels like a certain type of trope. I think that could have been more complicated and written differently but if that was the experience at the time or that was her experience at the time or that was just the way that it was looked at again like with the cloisters we were all expecting this very particular atmosphere or experience and it was something completely different maybe that was her knowledge of what was prevalent at whatever rehab facilities she did her research in during during that time period so there is what was then but there is also a lens from then to now and you're not sure wherever you fall inside of that lens whether it is that the the piece that was written just wasn't conscious about certain topics that we are more conscious of now or if things have just changed 
and we are a bit too conscious of certain tones that just existed. This is just the way life was or rehab was or, or you know, they were just fat old men batterers. But I think it's somewhere in the middle because you're kind of equating like, you know, fatness and oldness with being a bad person. Also, the book addresses our ideas of people being bad people because they are addicts. That is very much a part of this story and a part of everybody's journey. The forgiveness that the addicts who have more time in recovery have for people who are starting to realize that they were monsters in their addiction. And you see it from the lens of Rachel early on who is appalled by these monsters being forgiven by these other addicts and goes through the journey herself of realizing that she had been a monster and that she's still deserving of forgiveness. There is a lot uh, simplistic language in certain ways around some of these topics, but there is a lot of complexity at the same time that makes you realize that perhaps Marianne has some very real experience with the world of addiction, either through a family member or her own. And if not, then she really went to lengths to understand it in a very real way. I can say that personally from knowing that world and knowing that the struggle out of shame is oftentimes the hardest one to overcome over the span of your addiction. And hiding that shame a lot of times can result in a relapse of that addiction. And hiding shame in general is often how people end up in addiction because they are trying to quiet their feelings or thoughts about something that has happened to them, something they have lived through, or a way that they are that is difficult for them. So the story is way more, I guess, robust than Watermelon was. It ends up being a huge bestseller and it really puts Marian Keys on the map as one of the popular chick lit writers of that time. That's a horrible term, but I feel like it was definitely thrown around quite a bit in the early 2000s. You had a lot of popular novelists who were trying to write when women in a engaging and interesting way, not just as a participant in some kind of romance with a man, but as the heroine of the story, as somebody who you wanna know about, read about, and made her fabulous, and made her successful, and made her funny, and there are multiple series that were gaining popularity at the time. There were some notable ones with the Shopaholic series, which I have actually behind me. And Candace Bushnell was introducing us to Sex in the City around that time. So there was just kind of a moment of women with great shoes and great lives who are complicated figures that you wanna tell their story. From there, she ends up telling all of the sisters' stories. She tells you about Maggie, she tells you about Anna, she tells you about Helen. The family is so popular and you love them so much. They're such robust characters in and of themselves that she even writes a ebook that is uh, the mom's guide to the family. And within that, time she's also writing other novels about women all of her all of her novels have either been about a singular woman's story or a group of women's stories and as she's writing over time she just gets better and better and the way that she writes women and the way that she writes women's relationships with each other in particular is so nuanced and even from watermelon where she was a new writer the reason why you fell in love with that story was that the, the relationships between all of those women. It was when the sisters started arguing how they would talk to each other, how they would borrow each other's clothes, how they would bicker, how they would support each other. There was something that really resonated with women in general. And she's written t over 20 books in that vein. She also has some collections of essays. And then I guess she decided over 20 years later that it was time to bring Rachel back and tell you the, not the end of her story, but the again of her story. So she calls it, again, Rachel. One of the 
absolutely best books that I have ever read about a woman's story that was so funny and touching and just really, really honest. It felt so true and it felt like you were hearing about what's going on in Rachel's life all of these years later versus another story about her or about the family. So you meet Rachel again. She is a counselor at the cloister, which had been her kind of goal at the end of her, her book Rachel's Holiday. At the end of that book also, that's where it kind of had gone back to a rom-com where the situation with her ex-boyfriend, because he had broken up with her when he sent her to rehab, her ex-boyfriend Lou gets resolved where he comes and finds her after her year of being single and sober and working on herself. And he runs into her boarding house and tells her that he loves her and they live happily ever after, you assume, right? So you meet her again in her 40s, in her late 40s. All of the sisters are now middle-aged women. And and Claire is in here, Helen's in here, Anna's in here, they all make an appearance. Maggie also is in here. They've all changed. They've all lived a life. They are not the end of their story. Claire and Adam, who was the man she ended up finding and falling in love with at the end of her book, are into a few decades of marriage. They have grown kids and the sex just is not what it used to be. But Claire's still fabulous. She has amazing outfits. She's having a moment, if you will, and is at the beginning of menopause and kind of looking for, she does not, je ne sais quoi. Helen has, had been kind of the, she was the youngest sister. She was kind of the most beautiful and alluring to men in a certain way because of how mean she was. She was very, a very complicated character and she brings her to a place in life where she has struggled with depression, come out of it. And, and is just trying her best. She's still running a detective agency, which is where Marion puts her once Helen has her own story. Anna is sweet as ever, not doing any of the drugs that she so casually did early on. And Rachel is no longer with Luke. And the reader is like, <gasps> what? What do you mean? How is this possible? I don't understand. And she spends a lot of the book talking about or having flashbacks to or alluding to what may have happened to have ended their marriage because they actually did get married at the point that you, you see Rachel again they have been divorced for six years. And because Rachel's in the cloisters, you also get the added returning to moments with addicts, people telling their story, Rachel working with them. She is now the kind of straight and narrow, very hard ass counselor that she had had when she is in there. She's the one to be feared now. And she goes through these motions with different people at different journeys of their trying to become clean. And this time around, there's all of the behind the scenes of that journey from trying to get help into admitting that you actually have a problem into realizing how bad it was and, and taking that journey. But it's much more complex this time. There's much more thought. It's a different world. There's not just a bunch of old men who beat their wives. There's an old lady who has a gambling problem problem. There's a heroin addict who absolutely knows that he's an addict, but he still hasn't been able to find his way out of that. There is a mom who has a beautiful life with kids who still has done drugs. There is a young person who is still struggling with the idea of drugs not being okay and how it can ruin her life long term. This just the cast of people that she puts inside of the cloisters, the way that she does at this time is phenomenal and so well thought and having looked at the story before, instead of saying, I may not have got that right, I am going to write a whole different story. She says, I may not have got some things right. I am going to do this again the way that I think that I should have done it the first time around. And again, this is me obviously making assumptions because I don't know what's inside of Marion Key's mind, but she gets the chance to really take a fabulous part of that first book, Rachel's first book, not Marion Key's first book. She gets a moment to take something really great from that book 
and do it again with all of the skills that she's learned in all of these years that she's been writing. And it is just masterfully done. In that journey, kind of seeing where everybody's at, you're seeing where all the sisters at, you're celebrating the mom's 80th birthday, you're celebrating that Rachel has built this wonderful life. She's dating a very lovely man. She's living in her own house. She's gardening. They all have fabulous clothes. There is the sister chat. There is the body chat, but it is so positive. It is telling each other how hot they are all of the time. It is talking about things that you end up talking about as you're aging, like Botox and body treatments and hair coloring and all of that, but in such a a positive and cheeky and modern way. I really feel like she looked at what she had before, the core of what was so great about all of those stories, these relationships with women and how honest we can be with each other and just the funky conversations that we have, if people could hear how how in depth we get about some of that, you know, you talk about such personal things and this isn't just with sisters, this is with women in general. You talk about where you got Botox at, if it was you know, somewhere private, or you tell them what crazy treatment you were getting, because that's how women talk to each other. It's, it's the freedom of feeling like you're in a safe space and being able to be self-conscious and open about how difficult it is to be a woman and age and move through life and just finding a place where you feel wonderful within the madness. So she's she's telling that whole story and then Luke comes back into the picture because his mother has died. He comes back to Ireland and she starts to see him here and there and there are kind of stirrings of maybe what she thought her story with him had been isn't the actual story. What she thinks her story is is that Luke just kind of left her. He left her after they ended up losing their baby. Very soon before she was about to give birth she had gotten pregnant very late in life or what's considered late in life she had gotten pregnant around her 40s early 40s she went her whole pregnancy was she was perfectly fine and then at the, v the very end the baby didn't make it she's kind of under this impression or you're given the impression that she thinks that something from this having happened is how their relationship ended and you could believe it because even in the greatest love stories life happens tragedy happens and sometimes the whole cannot survive when the sum of its parts have worn away or been attacked or been lost to circumstance, to life, to pain, to struggle. So you're still on this journey with Marianne where you're saying like she is telling a really realistic story right now. Like this is life. The only thing is it's still Marianne Keys. She still kind of needs to bring it back to a happily ever after because that's just what feels good. And it is Rachel going through this journey with Luke delving into the past and it turns out actually that in her struggles after she lost her baby she started taking sleeping pills again she couldn't sleep for multiple days the doctor had ended up prescribing them to her and she starts abusing them at the time she didn't look at it that way she looked at it like my baby died and this was the only way for me to to get some rest i could i could not sleep i was in this fog she had spent multiple days where she couldn't sleep at all and she was told by her doctors this is non-habit forming as long as you don't abuse them it is completely normal for you to need some help and there were a few times where she was offered harder substances or more serious substances. They offer her Xanax and she knew, oh no, I'm a drug addict. No, I can't take that. She says no immediately. She just stays with her sleeping pills. And she starts to believe that Luke leaves because she can't really cope with the loss of their daughter. He can't either. They start moving away from each other and she thinks that he blames her for the loss of the baby the same way that she blames herself. At the very end, it comes out that he left because she was on drugs again. He left because that had taken over her life. He had just lost his baby and he was losing her too. And the only answer that he ever knew to get her to stop harming herself was to leave. And so he left, moved to Denver, tried to move on with his life, went through his grieving experience on his own. And once that revelation takes hold, Rachel now has to come to terms with the fact that she relapsed. 
past, even though she is this kind of model addict at this point. She is a counselor. She's been a counselor since she went back to Ireland after her and Luke split. She moved up through the cloisters from a junior counselor all the way to the head counselor. And the kind of ending message is that you can convince yourself that you're okay at any stage, even if you're going to meetings, even if you have community, even if you have support, you are always an addict and that danger is always there. And there's a reference in the end where I read it online that Marianne has actually been an AA. I don't know for how many years. And I'm assuming that that message was important for her to have in the story. The mom who is in the cloisters, who has a wonderful life, she's married to an aristocrat. Their kids are very successful. There is a kind of byplay between that mom and the group in their group session that really puts it the best. And I think is so true and, and just so eloquent. She's telling the story about how she she had been she had gone to rehab this was her second time in rehab she had gone to rehab she'd been clean for six years and then she relapsed and she's telling that story and Rachel says to her you had other options you knew you had and you still went for the dangerous ones she says yes yes and yes one of the other members of the group cuts in at this point and says but you're educated you know french words and the names of greek gods you got free of heroin years earlier so why would you do something so stupid she answers education makes no difference i forgot i was an addict no that's wrong i decided to forget why though if your life was good and this was this woman who was asking her this was somebody who had had a really tragic story that led her into addiction and so she's trying to understand or she was feeling like that is why i am here if i had had your life i never would have and the reality is that's not how it works she said why though if your life was good and the woman who is talking says but it wasn't and she goes on to explain some things in her life that had presented challenges for her and another patient again breaks in and says, I don't get it. Okay, you're upset about your daughter and your horses, but you kicked your habit. That's a big deal. Why would you take drugs that would lead you back to smack? She was an ex-heroin addict, which somebody using the word smack is a little, <laughs> is a little <laughs> whack, but... <laughs> She answers him and says, because we addicts, and she pointed at everybody in the room because there, there were people who were further along in their journey. There were people who were brand new, who didn't want to believe that they were addicts. She said, at our core, we want an excuse to relapse. Like Mike drop big, big, big facts. You don't ever want to actually stop doing drugs because you love them, they make you feel good, and they're fun. You want the chaos and the danger that your life has become to stop being like that. And the reality is you can't do both and you have to come to that realization. But that wanting to do drugs is forever there and you have to be vigilant forever because of that. She says to him, there were two versions of me, the one who wanted to be well and one who wanted to disappear into the drugs again. There will always be two of me. No matter how many clean years I have, the addict in me is always waiting for its chance. So good, so good, it's just so good. Besides the reality of addiction she writes the reality of starting over again so well this kind of place that you become in after you have shared a portion of your life living your way your life with somebody else or living your life a certain way and having to do this weird thing that we all do and and meet people and be vulnerable with them she is still figuring out how to do that with the man that she's been dating who is very successful very kind who's thoughtful, who's funny, who's complicated. He's can also be irritating. He can also be not a Prince Charming, not a fantasy. He can be a, a real person. And her struggling with having to build this life with somebody without kind of the blinders that you have when you are young and thinking that life is just going to be, again, back to first book, this idea of if I do this, then this, then this, then this happens and I live happily ever after that isn't real it's not real and she says it from a place of being in midlife or close to midlife and the story not being over because the story is not ever over until it's over so she says when she's talking about the the guy that she had, had been dating and kind of their evolution of a relationship at this point she is doing overnights she has gotten to know his kids they're i think together for about two years and moving to this more serious space but she's saying that you know this was their story and it's 
taken work. She said that that beautiful fantasy of after 10 minutes, I felt I'd known him all of my life didn't occur so much in reality. Nobody likes to hear this, but intimacy isn't a gift granted by the gods of love at first sight, but is something that has to be worked at, like learning to stay upright on a unicycle. This relative stranger wanted things for me, my time, my thoughts, access to my body. And for the first time in forever, the idea wasn't horrifying, which I put down to whatever strange business had gone on between us at the meditation weekend. It wouldn't be easy. I was out of practice. But if I wanted a life with love, I'd have to spend time with this person I didn't know. I'd have to sit in silences that were sometimes far from comfortable. I'd have to accept all the ways he wasn't looped. And that kind of discomfort of what you've known versus what you're trying to build is just something that we've all experienced because none of us lives kind of a unilateral, singular, straight line through life. There is no real straight timeline. It all goes like this. And we're so lucky that it goes like this because you get to do it over and over again. At the end of the story, once everything has been resolved, she does end up back with Luke. He comes back to Ireland. He resets his life. It is a still Prince Charming rom-com ending, but it, somehow it's okay. Somehow it doesn't feel cheesy. There's a bit of you that kind of wanted her to end up with Quinn, who was the guy that she had been dating because you want her to keep evolving. But alas, it is still a fairy tale. So all's well that ends well. And it's still one of the best books that I've read in a really long time. I'm going to say four pandas. Four pandas because it's Marion Keys, because it's the Walsh family, because she has aged them and written them after so much time with so much depth and love and you're just so happy to see them again and so happy to see how much they've grown up and how complex they've been and that they have lived a real life in the real world while you were living your real life in the real world for all of these years. It was just so well done. So until the next time, book friends, I hope you're reading something so wonderful that you can barely sleep at night because you're staying up half the night reading it and you're tired the next morning, even though you knew you should have gone to sleep sooner. I hope that you're reading something so wonderful that you think about it and it makes you smile. And I hope that you're liking this video and that you're subscribing and that you're gonna come back to the next one because, we're having such a good time and and I want our story to keep going. So until we meet again, alas, goodbye.